No, it's been an, an evolu evolutionary process for sure. Um, I think that um, there's, of course, been long attention to uh, biodiversity and, and, the, and the sources that we get from biological diversity. And I, I think the arguments for conservation of biodiversity historically have been, um, you know, it represents a, a library of genetic information and we're losing the library. Um, and that there are potential drugs and medicinal substances which we can derive from, from biological diversity. That, that's been the argument um, to try to conserve biodiversity for a long time. But uh, that hasn't resonated with a, the larger community, I think. And, and I think what's happened in this last decade, there's been a, a shift in uh, adding new arguments to the absolutely urgent need for con uh, conserving biological diversity. And the shift is uh, a move toward looking at biological diversity in terms of the um, how species act together, interact together to capture water and light and nutrients. And in, in, how, in doing this, they provide services to society. Essentially, these communities of organisms are our life support system. And so by framing uh, bi biodiversity and the consequences of biodiversity loss in terms of ecosystem services, as benefits to society, that resonates more directly with the policymakers, it resonates directly, more directly to, to the public, and it's been, a, I think, a, a real important additional view of, of the consequences of the loss of biological diversity and, ecosystem, and hence ecosystem services. Ecosystem services have become more mainstream in policy and in, and in dialogues with the public and dialogues with the industry and so forth. So it's, it's, it's really permeated uh, many dimensions of, of dialogue in society. That's a good question. Uh, it, there's some complexity to that <laughs> question. Uh, one is that you don't have ecosystem services without biological diversity. <laughs> services are derived from biological diversity. The complexity of communities and the numbers of species and how they interact determine the kinds of services you get. So it's one's derived from the other. I think where the, the, um, the, the concern is with certain groups of people is that uh, in looking at ecosystem services, uh, you try to, different groups, communities deliver different amounts of services, and some are more important to society than others. And so there's a, a valuation process, you know, what is, uh, how, how valuable are these services and the species and communities which deliver them? Some are more valuable than others. Now, but value, you can have an economic valuation and you can have a value, an intrinsic value. And they're both important and it depends on whether you're thinking about it globally and then you could do economic valuation, but the, the more locally you, you get, and that's where, where uh, cultural services, the cultural value becomes over, overriding. But where the split is, is that some people working in biological diversity think that economic valuation will take away from, from consideration for biological diversity per se, because some species will not have high economic valuation than others. But they are dependent on one another, they should be considered together, and I'd hate to see them sp separated. There's so-called uh, regulating services, you know, that how species uh, filter the water, how species uh, moderate the climate, how species, the pollination services we get, they're not in the marketplace, but yet they have great value. But then there are other services which are, I say, cultural, um, inspiration from, from nature, which you can't, val you can't value in economic terms, but yet are crucial to our, our, our own personal well-being. So it just, it's a mixed bag and, uh, it, and they'll, it, they will play out differently in, in different regional, in different regions and different areas of uh, consideration. It's going to be an iterative process in the sense that, uh, again, what's being proposed for IPBES is that there's actually a dialogue between the policymakers and, uh, and the scientific community in what kinds of questions should be addressed. What are the, what are the policy needs? What are the most urgent needs? And what, and what kinds of information we had to fill those needs 
and where the gaps are and how we should direct our attention. So that's, that dialogue is very important. But there are going to be issues which the policy community hasn't um, uh, addressed or been necessarily aware of. And where I think it's the responsibility of the science community to sort of bring those issues to the attention of the policy community. So there'll be some, there'll be two-way interaction and there'll be some one-way policy coming down to science and science going up to policy. So it'll be the package. To me, that's a, fa a fascinating question because I don't think our um, policymaker, the community, really hasn't faced up to those issues. And you know, one I think uh, unfortunate move is the W, the World Trade Organization, seems to have precedence over over the environment. The, the consequences of globalization uh, for the environment are, are, are rather large, but yet aren't given. Um, due consideration. And we're, we're seeing all kinds of uh, environmental consequences in terms of disease transmission around the globe, in terms of invasive species. And the Convention on Biological Diversity, as all UN conventions actually make the case that um, the first thing to consider is each nation has its sovereign rights over the, over the uh, biodiversity in its, in its country. And they decide what to do with it and how to, how to treat it and so forth. There's actually a second part of the UN Charter, which says it also has the responsibility to be concerned about any damage that the, the biological material does in, in some other country, invasive species. But no attention is really actually paid to that. So uh, globalization is, uh, is a big environmental issue there. there. There's some good things. You know, some nations are... are, are lack uh, environmental services provided by biota, so you can trade services in terms of nitrogen and water and so forth. A, a water poor country can, well, look at Japan. Japan uh, imports a tremendous amount of resources, um, which uses the water from you know, the United States, for example, to grow the, the, the grain and so forth. So I, I think we haven't paid enough attention to it, and uh, we need to. You know, I, I personally am interested in that, and I'm and uh, we're having a big uh, meeting on ecosystem services in the United States uh, shortly, and one whole uh, session is going to be on that topic. Yeah. I think there is an opportunity to, uh, to trade services, but to be, un be clear exactly what the consequences are to the receiving country and to the, and to the exporting company, uh, country. Just we have to me, it's like understanding better the life cycle analysis. I think we've really learned a lot this last few years about, you know, you get a product, you know, how was it made, where was it made, and where is it, how is it disposed of, and just that full chain. And I think we need that for ecosystem services too. Well, I think um, the way I'll interpret transdisciplinary science is that uh, the coming together of science, you know, scientists from various disciplines to, to look at a problem, uh, which e in any discipline can't solve themselves. I mean, we we'll just look at climate change. Uh, climate change, uh, the scientists can, uh, physical scientists can say, you know, how the climate system operates and what's happening, and the biologists can say what the consequences are to the biota, but uh, what to do about it, and how does the, how does the, public understand the issue? How do they respond to the issue? Uh, I, I think you need this, you need this dialogue between, between uh, the science findings to how people, how people respond, how they, how they operate, bef so you can target information in a way that will that maybe make a difference. But I, I, it's, just, it's really an exciting period. I think that, that you see in universities where, where modeled, um, you know, the design was from the a uh, long time ago, German universities in the 1800s, by narrow disciplines, and the, each each department gets narrower and narrower, and there's no hasn't been any really interaction for the bigger problems. And I think there's now a backward movement to try to get uh, more overarching views of um, of how society works, how science works, and how science and society interact. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which I was involved in, we had 50 percent natural scientists and 50% social scientists as we addressed 
what's happening to ecosystems and ecosystem services. And that people thought it wouldn't work because these communities haven't really op uh, communicated very well together, but it worked really well. And I think we made some, some big advances. Uh, and I see the excitement in universities now with these new programs because uh, we still have to have specialists, but the specialists have to understand that they can do, an indivi given individual can accomplish much more if they collaborate with a, a neighboring scient <laughs> scientist so they can do a broader, a broader vision, a, a broader uh, goal. Of sustainability is a little bit different in a way. It, it, you need both of this interdisciplinarity, but it means that you're focusing on on not just efficiency of, of production, not just uh, uh, all these other things, but you you're, have to focus on, can you still have these services a generation from now? How do we, how do we get the things we need to uh, make society operate at the same time that the future generations can, uh, can operate? So it's, it's a different way of thinking and a different way of organizing your business and organizing your, your policy and so forth. I talk to students, I tell them, you know. They can talk to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> just, just remember that someone is paying you to do something which you really like. You get to work on things that you think are important, and they probably are important, but someone is, 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 pay, is paying you to do this with some expectation, and that's the public. And they, they're, you know, supporting science because they think that science can perhaps deliver something to to bettering their way of life. So if you think that way, then, then you can say, well, I, I have an obligation. I have a social obligation to repay society in some way. And uh, there, you, you try to teach students to you know, do work on fundamental problems and something which will be general around the world. But you can say, you can use a model system, but then use one which maybe has some practical application you would get at the fundamental science, but at the same time, you might have something um, that would you work on a species which is maybe particularly relevant or, or in, in, in delivering services or something. So always remember you have an obligation. Always remember that you have special skills. You can, you can really help society by your special skills and your special training, but also think, um, how can I do it? How could I make what I'm doing more relevant to every, every day of the people in the street?